Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Lockdown Literature, courtesy of the Studio Online and the National Lottery Community Fund. You are about to listen to a selection of audio stories gathered together during the COVID-19 lockdown from both the adults and children's write-on sessions. So relax, settle back, and enjoy a selection of writing from some of the finest creative minds at the studio. The Routine by Richard Bradshaw The Routine by Richard Bradshaw The Leaving Five to. There's Angie, her bag swinging almost off her statuesque shoulder as a normally dainty step grows into a dancing stride as the daily shackles are loosened for the night. She and Beth like to enjoy a couple of glasses of wine after work before they part for home. Neither of them drinks at home. Pizza, yes. Angie has a boyfriend, but she can't always remember which one. Here's Beth now. Petite, eight and a half stone. She'll let anyone in on this fact. She wants to get to eight and soon. <laughs> when she walks towards you, those sidestepping desks, she's like a nimble-footed 15 stone rugby loose forward with a head of steam up and you, my friend, are the full back. The only remaining possible impediment to her annihilation of you and all your companions. Do you want to tackle her? Leave it. It's only a game. Survival of the fleetest. Smile. It's your only defence. There they go. Louis wine bar for a good wine. I don't know that for a fact, but I say it because I don't know any better. I've never joined them. I don't think anyone ever has. Not from here, anyway. Now, Stuart. As soon as the door swings closed behind Beth and Angie, up on his feet and heading my way. There they go, he says. Off for their refreshing wine. He always says the same thing, every time. Maybe he just means wine. One thing's for sure. I'm not going to ask. I look up at the clock, anything to avoid catching his eye. I've no idea what Stu does, but whatever it is, he's just a front for it. Maybe he sells drugs in a supermarket car park. It's three minutes to now. <laughs> now there's a thought. Maybe I'll write a sketch around that and send it off to that comedian on the telly. The one I like. The one I'm much funnier than. He says, what time is it? The other says, it's three minutes to now, so he says. Three minutes to now? See you at five past then, then. Hey, the first, hey, will that be with or without the commas? And then, That's just what, if you fancy a pint. Stew again. Rally driving into my little daydream. He's at the door now, but looking back over his shoulder to complete his unchanging end of day mantra. No thanks, Stu. I've got to drivel on for three more minutes, I smile as I answer. I do not add the fact that I would rather take my chances crossing a motorway blindfold than go for a drink with him. It's an unwritten law here that it doesn't matter if it's five to, one minute to, however close it may be, there has to be at least one of us still here at five o'clock on the dot just in case Barnaby slides his hair-sprayed head through the door to say something even more banal than anything the poor sod left behind to hear it has heard all day. Tonight, it's my turn. But so far, his head hasn't shown. Bartholomew Barnaby, B.A. Ons, in Smile. Rudyard Tiltskin, Angie calls him. And he makes some smarmy, smiling, smart-ass comments in return. But then Angie's very pretty. So is Beth. 
But even shit for brains, Barnaby knows better than to say anything to Beth that he wouldn't have the goodies to repeat. I like Beth. Barnaby Rudge. <laughs> I like that. Barnaby's like something you might win in a cornflake packet and not bother with. He's all right, I suppose. No, he isn't. Stu's gone now. Probably gone to see his cornflake dealer. I know for a fact that he pretends to be on the phone sometimes. What a git. Two minutes to go now, and it's near as silent as it ever gets in this office. I don't mind this. A moment to think, a moment just to check if the world still has a moment's quiet for the likes of me to inhabit. I wonder what it's like when I'm not here. But I'm not going to come back to find out. <laughs> Five o'clock. Me one. Barnaby nil. I'm off. I don't go to the pub after work anymore. It had only turned into a session, even if the first couple of times didn't. Besides, after a while, the pubs around here get to seem just like being at work, but without getting paid for it. I'll tell you about Wally and Ada sometime, but not right now. I'd need a pint for her. They're all right, though. Honest. The bus stop. Ten past five. Either the bus is late or I'm early. Whichever way you look at it, I have to wait. No, I mean, I choose to wait. Well, I have to, really. If I want the bus, that is. Here they are. I haven't seen them all week. Mr and Mrs. Don't know their names. Not everything can be measured in time, but many can be clocked. Here we go. Watch this. One, they approach. Two, they arrive at the bus stop and stop. Three, he turns and faces the road. Sorry, surveys the road. He could be a military commander on a hilltop, having a last tactical sweeping look before giving the order to engage. He lifts and lowers his heels several times, police constable fashion, turning his metronomic head from left to right and back again slowly in time, as if his nose were a heavy broadsword he was wielding on behalf of the Duke of Edinburgh. Four. He claps his hands together far in front of him, like a baker clearing flour from his hands. Then, and this has no number, he says, Boss not here, then? Nobody answers him, and he doesn't look surprised. He never repeats the question. He never mentions which bus, and now that I think of it, I've never seen him board one. He's always and ever still at the stop when I leave. Now that it occurs to me, I find that extremely odd. She is smiling, but then she always is. And I do mean always. Always. Got it? She has a voice which is very high and even more strident. It seems to be the only voice she has. She must speak to all small children, vicars, policemen, shop assistants and visiting dignitaries in exactly the same way. She is also, and forgive the term, one of those people, for she is one of those people who seems to find every utterance by herself or any other human being completely, hopelessly, hysterically hilarious. She laughs at everything. Her laugh? <laughs> I haven't even mentioned it. I can't. To share a lift with her would be agony. To be stuck in one, the stuff of nightmares. A comment upon, say, the weather would have her in stitches. Remember when I said always? I meant always. Got it? Some people unobtrusively shuffle along the queue to minimise the effect. Me? I shovel myself away to where I can be at least one ricochet away from the initial shock of the onslaught. 
Nobody could tolerate this volley unshielded. A fireman rescuing her from a burning building would throw her away halfway down the ladder. Mr. Don't know his name, surveys her well. Perfectly nice people, though. Very kind to dogs. Here comes my bus. The Gourmet Run Possibly my favourite part of the journey home, but probably not. In the thoroughfare I pass along on my final approach to Shay Me, there are four takeaway establishments. Five at times, though one keeps changing hands and reopening for a while, but four guaranteed. I won't list them, but I run them through my head as I walk along the street. What shall it be tonight? I choose whichever has the longest queue, blurt my order out and explain I have to go, turning to ask, rather like Stu at the door, how long it's likely to be. I add another 10 minutes to their response time and adjourn, yes, you heard me, to the pub which sits halfway down the street, the equidistant arms as I call it. I have one drink, sometimes a hurried second if the takeaway queue is long. Tonight, Wally is behind the bar. Ada is not. Evening, Walt, well, I say, just to let any possible strangers in the pub know what's what, or at least let them know that I do. Where's Ada? Off scuba diving again? I promise you, Mrs. Dunno her name would find this indescribably funny. Better than that fella on the telly. Not just now, says Wally. She's just upstairs trying to get the budgie back in its cage. Mrs. Dunno and him would be pissing herself by now if she were here, but she's not. So I do my imitation of a short, uproarious chuckle. The three or four regulars that I know all smile at me, happy that they know something I don't and I'm tent hooks for my next inquiry. I don't make one. Sardin, I'm not in the mood tonight. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, bless them all, I say. But I've got other fish to fry, or to be more precise, kebab to scoff. I want them to see that I'm a busy man. I down my drink, nod a goodbye to Wall, silent smile my way past the rest, and I'm out of there. A narrow escape. But I'm not sure who for. I won't talk you through the meal. There's enough of them getting paid for that on the telly, the radio, in magazines and special pull-out features in almost any newspaper you care to name, which I don't. Talk about money for old rope. Let's just say that the picking up and subsequent digestive disposal of the kebab went off without a hitch and leave it at that, shall we? It was well-timed and flawless. It restores your faith. The evening. Settled now. As far as I can tell, I owe no outstanding debts to society as a whole or any portion thereof. I look at the walls. One of them creaks. I look at the curtains. They yawn. I have no pets, but next door's parakeet, name of Ernie, fills in the gap. A glass of wine, I think. If Angie kissed me, I'd faint. If Beth kissed me, I'd surrender. If Stu doesn't have a personality transplant soon, I'll take up karate. Ernie, the raucous little bugger, squawks. I assume in agreement. Ernie understands every word you say. I know this because my neighbours told me so. I didn't know he was telepathic as well. I'll make a note. I look to see what's on the telly. There's a small side plate with a half-eaten sandwich which I balanced on top of the set yesterday just to see if I could. It's still there. I take the plate to the kitchen, dumping the sandwich en route. I enjoy these impromptu experiments. They probably serve a purpose. I wonder what it is. 
The book I'm reading lies open, face down on the kitchen table, on top of the photo like a bird of prey covered in its latest grounded meal. Spread eagle, you might say. Then again, you might not. I won't tell you the name of the book. I haven't finished it yet. And besides, I don't want to set Ernie off. That's a joke. It tickled me anyway. Shall I shape up and go out tonight? I don't know. All said and done, I'm quite settled. The ticking. Trouble is, I feel so unsettled. I've just realised what they were all waiting for in the pub. They wanted me to ask the budgie's name. I'll tell them next time I'm in that I'm thinking of getting a rescue dog. Just drop it into the conversation. But that I want one with no nose. Idiots. I can hear next door's telly. Emmerdale. Apparently Ernie loves that, as do my neighbours. A very happy coincidence. Paraphernalia and out. Keys, phone, cigarettes, money, ready. I roll the first dice, an even number, so I will turn right out of my door. Second dice, a four. I will take the fourth turn in on the third dice, left. Fourth dice, abracadabra. The rest is my choice, to be made on the hoof. I roll all five dice, two birds and a six. You never know your luck. I never walk for more than 30 minutes. I hope the rain holds off. There's a football match on in the pub. Stu will talk about it tomorrow, so I ignore it completely. I'll check the score and score us though before I leave, just so I know where that lying bastard's lying again. He just makes things up. I don't contradict him, but sometimes I know. I quite like football. I like watching it, the people in the pub booing and cheering, heaving and groaning together, arguing the toss. I like listening to them trotting out the pundits platitudes like they were their own observations, sucking on their imaginary Sherlock pipes. Elementary, my dear, what's on? I remain at the bar with my drink. It's a strategic choice. From there, you can go anywhere, I... I don't sit down because any later unexplained changing of seats would draw attention, I always feel. People might wonder why, and without a pundit to tell them what to think, who knows what might transpire. I turn a half circle and lean back lightly against the bar. My head keeps turning though, full circle. I survey the whole place. I am bus stop man taking it all in. There's not a lot, if truth be told, to take in, but I do. Someone scored. Hooray! <laughs> I never bring the dice out with me anymore. I used to. I'd slip them into my pocket on the way out the door like worry beads or something. Not anymore. I don't know why being amongst total strangers takes the edge off things, but it does. Helps to clear my mind, like, like pausing the news or something. I gave all this up, see, two or three, wait a minute, five years ago. Five years ago, bloody hell, five years. Still, follow the routine, same as ever. Nothing should go wrong. Never rush anything. Deadlines are for other people, and that's no joke. Nor is this bugger. He's no slouch either. Thinking too much now. Leave it. Let go of the edge. I'll check it over yet again when I get home. Wednesday today. I could even leave it till the weekend. Best before, though. I could go away for a couple of days. Maybe more. 
full of sicky. <laughs> there was a laugh. No, no sickies. Not this week. Not next either. I don't think I can say much more. When your legal job starts to affect your real employment, it's time to have a think. I'll go through it once more when I get in. Follow the routine. The trouble with being amongst total strangers is that you can't always get a game of darts when you fancy one. What the hell? One more won't hurt. Make it a double. One short of a hangover. Anyway, Friday's when he catches up. May as well rob the bugger. It only makes sense. As long as you do it carefully. No nonsense. Yes, Friday's when he catches in. Besides, there's a documentary on tomorrow I want to watch. Wildlife. It calms me down. My business. I don't mean to seem unfriendly, but I'm not going to talk to you for a bit. Things to do. Friday evening. It's funny how quickly things change. Change completely. Bank transfers on the phone and what have you. You hardly think of anyone having a safe these days. You know, with cash and that. Maybe a bit of jewellery. Valuables as we generally term them when we're being polite. If it wasn't for Theo, I would not never touch the stones. Dead traceable. But Theo's class one. You go to him. He never comes to see you. You never hear from Theo. Not a whisper. And that's okay by me. What's that you said? Oh, yeah. The job. The job? Hardly anything to tell. I followed the routine. I picked up the van yesterday morning and did a test run. No problem. Underground car park. Little motorbike in the back, ramp, all very quiet. As for the job itself, I went at dinner time. I've never stayed and eaten in the office like some. Not once in the months I've been working and shirking there. My alibi of absence. The motorbike was a nice touch. No trouble with traffic. Nice discreet helmet over my lovely face. Gloves inside my gloves. Muddy number plates, parked at the back, nobody else around, just him and the week's takings, so I just took that. One shot and I was halfway up the building before he hit the floor, dead as the proverbial. I wasn't even late back to the office. The bike's back in the van now. I'll pick that up tomorrow. I won't drive home in it tonight. I wouldn't want anyone to miss me at the bus stop. Sometimes people notice things. The police came, of course, to inform Beth of the horrendous news. They spoke to her in Barnaby's office while he wandered around hours, saying how he couldn't believe it and how it was incredible, which both mean the same thing, the cretin. Beth's husband had been shot, you see, robbed by an unknown assailant while he was counting the takings from the dry cleaning shop he owned. He was dead. The shop was one of a chain, it seems. I didn't know that. Beth was bereft. Angie sent out for a bottle of wine and told me and Stu to go home early. She hasn't got the authority to do that, but hey, who's arguing? I don't know if she sent Barnaby home. Someone should. In the lift on the way down, I say to Stu, fancy a pint? Of course he does. We had a couple of drinks, exchanged a few phrases, yeah, terrible, and such like. It was funny seeing what he looked like when he was being all genuine. And I was back outside the office building at five o'clock exactly. I arrived at the bus stop at the same time as ever. I planned it that way, of course. I wouldn't want anyone to clock me. Sometimes people notice things. Of course. It was Beth that hired me. There's no way she knows that, but I do. Stands to reason. 
She's a better actress than me, I can tell you. I almost felt sorry for her myself, sobbing away into a bank book. Who knows how many lips the murmur passed through before my phone rang. Anyway, I got the job. Contract, they call it. A couple of days later, I got the address and the photograph. I didn't really need the office job, but I, I went along and got it. More than once, I asked myself what I was doing there. But I like to prepare well, you know, get into the routine. People notice things that are out of the ordinary, so sometimes you just shouldn't. But I couldn't help myself. I was leaving this job soon. I might never get another chance and, oh, what the hell does it matter why? So when Mr and Mrs Dunoda names arrive at the bus stop and just after he claps his hands and says, bus not here then, I ask him, excuse me, sir, which bus do you mean? The elongated pause was delightful to my ear. He looked at me like I was a tortoise on a seesaw. I continued, I mean, which bus are you waiting for? For once, the only time I ever witnessed it, Mrs. name made no sound at all. None. Got it? Makes you think. Then I turned on my heel and nipped over the road, dancing through the traffic straight into Louis' wine bar. I could see them through the window, both laughing. I always have a good look round these days whenever I'm waiting for public transports of any kind. You never know who might be at a bus stop.